We're looking at the CARE Act and we're looking at eligibility for advocacy. And I love this because as we know from sort of the myths that advocacy for all was, was CARE Act, it's, it's not. It's a very prescribed set of people. So the first one is that somebody has to have substantial difficulty. So we're using the same four criteria as is under the Mental Capacity Act of understanding information, retaining information, weighing up information and communicating information in whatever format that person chooses. For substantial difficulty, the social worker decides whether the person has substantial difficulty in any one, at any level, and any of those four things. So it doesn't have to be all of them, it can be just one of them at a lower level, for instance, than that of the Mental Capacity Act. The third section, the two if you like, is about whether a person is able to facilitate the active involvement in the decision making process of the adult the care and support needs. And so that means, are they available? Do they have the time? Can they go to the meetings? Can they meet with the person in advance? Do they understand what the person likes, dislikes, what their needs are, what they want their outcomes to be? So it's all about the person and not about them. And also it's about, have they been asked? Are they willing? Do they want to do it? Um, and that's an interesting question to ask, I find, when I, when I meet with carers, that just if there's a presumption that they will do it. And they don't know that there is access to an independent advocate. They just feel they have to do it. And the next caveat is that that person must not be paid. So although there may be a support worker that knows that person well, they would not be seen as that person's appropriate adult to support them because they are paid to be in that role. And what's interesting is that once that person has agreed and said, yes, I'll do that, I can support him, then the person themselves, the client has to be asked, do you want them to support you? And again, I do question how many times that happens. So let's imagine we've got somebody that's appropriate and available to support the person through the, uh, facilitate their involvement in the decision-making process. The last part of that is, is there any conflict? So if the person supporting is in conflict with the local authority or vice versa, then if they both agree that it is in the person's best interest to have an independent advocate, then one can be referred to. And those four processes under the CARE Act are assessment, so a CARE Act assessment of need, Okay. A care planning process, sometimes called a care and support plan, or the review process, which is no more than 12 months, and finally in safeguarding processes. So those are the four processes that Care Act advocacy cover. So there are four groups of people that are entitled to Care Act advocacy. The first group of people are adults with um, substantial difficulty who have care and support needs. There are carers of adults who have substantial difficulty in care and support needs. Now those carers include young carers. There's no minimum age limit within the Care Act but it's, it states that those that are working will have those caring responsibilities as they become adults. So I would say around year nine, 14 year olds, that's where those responsibilities to uh, allocate an advocate become um, statutory under the CARE Act. And the final group is young people that are going through the transition stage. So that's transition from children into adult services. And again, the CARE Act talks about year nine, so that sort of school age of around 14. Most local authorities, and it's always worth checking, um, really start that around 16. 
So that's when they start actually pinpointing what is the need post 18. But at a minimum, you should be there at 60, I would have said. So I think it's worth knowing if you don't hold the contract for children and it sits within a children's organisation, having some conversations about have you got any young people coming up to 18 because once they become adults, they sit within my contract. And it's better because we're client led and we're person centred to get to know that person beforehand and understand that ending process for one and that transition to support post 18. And the fourth group is carers of children that are going through the transition process. And this is an area that we very, I as an uh, assessor, very rarely see any information about when I go out and see and assess advocates. And I wonder, I wonder whether that's because they, they feel quite competent and they don't feel that they need advocacy. So those four groups of people, the most common one that you will be working with would be the adults with the care and support needs. The second will be the carers of those adults with care and support needs. The third group, which be less, will be children going through the transition process. And the smaller group would be the carers of those young people going through transition. And I think it's important when we think about the standards, going back to our accessibility and ensuring that we are accessible. As, a, as an advocacy service to all those four groups of people. So one of the questions I often get asked in training is, well, we don't work with young people, so where are they? And I, my answer always is, I don't know, have you asked? So it's about having that chat with your manager when you finish your training and say, there's four groups, we only ever work with the first group. So what are we doing to enable the other three groups to know that we exist and what we can do through the care app processes to support them.